The views and opinions of the hosts and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the position of the management and staff of Guardian Network. Morning this morning and welcome back to Guardian Radio 96.9 FM, your station for fresh news, smart talk all day. It is Tuesday, the 25th of October, 2022, and you are on the clock with Erin Green. On the clock, we engage organizations and ordinary people to better understand the impact of public policy private se sector development, and emerging social and consumer trends. It's the 25th of October, and sitting in with me is Mr. Mark Palmer on this World News Tuesday. It's great to have you back, Mr. Palmer. Good morning, Erin. Good to be back. I spent, yes. a, I spent a week in Eleuthera. Yeah, I know, on a plum exploration, except you carried on like the government. Ain't no report, <laughs> ain't no audit, <laughs> you, ain't, you ain't submit no paperwork, no hog plums were returned to the office, nothing, Mr. Palmer. If you did work for government, I couldn't have fired you. Exactly. I'm so, I apologize on air. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't really sorry. That, it no. was great to have you back. Um, we you. have joining us today Alicia Wallace from Equality Bahamas. Good morning, Ms. Wallace. Okay, she's not back yet. It seems she's also in Naughty Lutra on a hog plum exploratory uh, mission. But don't watch nothing. She'll be with us uh, shortly. Um, one of the things that we're going to talk about today... We have a new prime minister in England. <laughs> <laughs> Rishi Sumak. Now, well, that, no, wait, but that, that was so quick. You yeah. even talked about the old one that, we, she, that she used gone. to be the new one. Six weeks, yeah. That's the third. It's, uh, Great Britain is becoming a bit like Italy, who had like 50 prime ministers in like 10 years. So now we've had three in like but six months. How many of them were, um, what's the guy's name, Sarkozy? What's the, one, the, the, the singer, the entertainer? How many, how many of those nine were him? I have no idea. Because he liked to win. He's like um, Khan in Pakistan. Right. Well, well, Sunak, I don't think he's any Imran Khan, but he's yeah. an interesting guy, right? Because they call him uh, Rishi Washi. His first name is Rishi because yeah. the, apparently nobody can find anyone, uh, uh, an original view coming out of him. And uh, so he's basically a reader of auto but cues. This is, <laughs> no, <laughs> but this that, is, that sounds familiar, right? But this is the leader of today. But this is great. It's, so, it's only a question of who is he taking his cues from? So I don't mind that. Once he's taking his cues from the people, mm -mm. we could be okay. Well, you know that ain't happening. But the interesting thing about him is he's actually... Uh, he married very well. He married the uh, his his wife's father is the sixth richest man in India. Yeah. So he has a company called Infosys, which is so there's a lot of um, uh, oh, blowback so going because uh, that company has you know it has ties with China and it's all about digital security and and uh, social credit scores and uh, clearly with a father-in-law like that, you know, people are watching if there's going to be any corruption, any contracts, but clearly he has that view of the WEF that this is where we're going to go, you know, digital IDs and, the, and central uh, bank currencies. And, and as some people would say that we become like a dog on a leash yeah. to, the, to the system, you know, we won't be able to, if you're, if you're obese, you won't be able to buy sugar and, and things like that or fatty foods. They could cut that right off, right? Anyway, so not I, in the Bahamas. No, that, that, that could never happen in the Bahamas. But so it'd be interesting to see what happens. I mean, yeah. he's very dull, but highly educated, intelligent. But uh, what's his name? Uh, is it John Major? Who was yeah, duller? He was pretty dull. In fact, he yeah. was so dull that in cartoons and editorials, he would be gr they would gray him out. That's how dull he was. But he wasn't that dull because he actually had an affair with one of his cabinet ministers. I don't know if you. <laughs> <laughs> Man, look so here. You, you, all thought, you all thought Boris Johnson was the wildest prime minister you all ever had. He no, had great sir. hair, though. Huh? Great hair. Boris. Yeah. The, the, you see, with Boris, he had passion, right? Now, I'm not a Boris Is that what you call that? Passion? He was, he, he, he was a brilliant speaker. You know, some people, they come, they have passion. They, uh, they, they talk, you know, with real... Uh, look here, I I'm would a, say it's integrity, but, you know, he, he talks well. Yeah. You feel like, oh, th this is somebody... 
But we have so many people that just. Oh. Is there a difference between he talks well and he resonates with the people? Because I, I don't I don't think he talks not, well, but no. I think he resonates with the people. Who? Boris. Bo oh yeah, Boris yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. somebody like uh, they call, they call it the red wall. These are the voters that you need to catch for the Conservative Party, right? Yeah. And, and people can't see him walking into a pub and really connecting with people. He's too wealthy, you know. He's Oxford educated, a perfect conservative, you know. Yeah. The, Establishment figure. I don't know why y'all don't want to talk about my girl Truster. Y'all just kick out like that. Nothing. Yeah, she's. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I'm gonna say this, and it's gonna she be a little. Follow rough. the script. Right? No, she smiled too much. She smiled too much, and I know. No, she started off well. She was, you know, I'll press the button for the nuclear bomb against yeah, Russia. Yeah, and then she started smiling. They, you think that Margaret, was it? Okay, Margaret Thatcher mm -hmm. only smiled once in her entire career as a politician. I certain of that. Trust smiled too much. That's what the problem but, is. You know, when you look back at the people like Thatcher, she and Churchill, I, I suppose another example, yeah. they had their own views, their own opinions, and their yeah. agendas, and they pushed them despite huge opposition in cabinet. I don't think that will ever happen again. Yeah. We become too much of a partisan politics. Yeah. I mean, so the same thing is happening so in Britain. It's happening in Bahamas. It's happening in Britain too. I think so. I think you yeah. have to be a player, you know, team player. You have to say the right things and uh, yeah. not be controversial. Once you get in, of course, you can do whatever you want. But Party over everything. One yeah. leader. Yeah. I, that, well, I would be surprised that started well, right when here. When Boris stood down, he mentioned I 27 times and the British people once. So that gives you an idea <laughs> yeah. of where he's coming from, right? Absolutely. So I got uh, just a couple of small housekeeping things before we get back on the line with Miss Wallace. Dear Miss Truss, um, I don't know. Let me just give you an example from the Bahamas. Our two most successful uh, Bahamian politicians, they did never smile. L um, Loretta Butler Turner and Alison Maynard Gibson, they don't smile. I saw Alison smile once or twice. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> She had a nice smile. She has a beautiful smile. Yeah. That's why you keep it, you hide it. You hide it. You see what I'm saying? That's why I can't never get into politics. You're saying you got to be serious, right? Yeah, apparently I seriously. smile with my eyes all the time. Mm. That's what that way pre minutes say. Before we get there, the uh, something interesting in the news on Sunday, the government announced uh, the launching of the National Youth Guard, which I thought was interesting. We're going to talk about that in future shows, uh, mm -hmm. ages 18 to 25 and to assist with uh, post-disaster efforts. Also, uh, somebody shared with me that there was a law, maybe I heard it on the radio, or maybe someone who was listening to Morning Blend this morning shared it with me. Um, there's supposed to be, a, a rule was proposed that you don't just patch the pothole, but that you pave uh, a, a, a boundary, right? like a perimeter, around the part of whole, um, and I think that's to sort of stabilize the work, if I could use layman's terms. Also, remember I told you all the Bahamian people need somebody to look out for them the same way that tourism has people looking out for it. Um, hotels are asking for relief in the new uh, fuel surcharge increase, and I'm gonna say to the hotels, go check Urca. Now is a very good time to go talk to Urca because Urca said that they're still reviewing the proposal. Urca says that this is all still in proposal stage and because if they had actually completed the review, they indicated um, that they were initiating on October 11th, right? That's when the statement came out, October 11th, and it is the, what, 25th, that's what, two weeks. We would have seen that statement by now, right? That would have been a public discussion including the question as to how could the government make an announcement like this without having already uh, achieved, uh, uh, um, gotten IRCA approval for the rate increase. So dear hotels, go check IRCA, you may still have time. Now we the regular Bahamian people ain't no being for us, but you, you're pretty special. Mm -hmm. You may have an in. Also, shout out to Officer 633. Shout out to Officer 633 who made a tour bus parked on the sidewalk in front of Scotia East move and park in a proper parking area because he was blocking pedestrian traffic on one of the most dangerous stretches for pedestrians on East Bay Street. 
I can say the uh, tour bus was not on duty. You know, tourism workers sometimes like to act like they're uniform forces, like they police. They never off duty. Their job is always more important than your job, right? But they they weren't actually on duty. There were no tourists in the bus, and so I don't think that they are afforded that privilege. Um, but this officer actually went into the bank to find the driver and question the security officer as to how he let it happen. And this is important for me, Mark, mm. because when a uh, small work van, when the boy drove the work van on the sidewalk as I was walking on it, and I indicated to the security guard that perhaps he should tell the boy he can't park on the sidewalk, the security guard looked at me as if, why would you think that that's my job, ma'am? Mm. Why would you think that I was posted outside the bank to tell people don't park on the bank sidewalk because pedestrians need to use it? Anyway, I would like to thank Officer 633 and thank you for standing up despite the obvious social pressure to ignore these blatant infractions. Well, you should come to Eleuthera because it's, you don't see any of that. You know who should go, come to Eleuthera? <laughs> The government should come to Eleuthera so that they could understand to move at the pace of development in Eleuthera. Eleuthera has done all of the right things, right? Mm -hmm. They have sought out the resources they need understand themselves, understanding you know, the tremendous pressure the government has on it. It has developed island-wide, community-wide um, strategic plans for development. Uh, for urban planning, for environmental concerns, for agricultural concerns, right? They are focused on it without the need of the government. And all the government has to do is make sure that it's doing its part at the right time. I mean, the economy seemed to be doing quite well in Eleuthera because I spoke to several people who were doing the census and they said they found very few people out of work. Uh -huh. You know, a small, small amount. Most people were working. That's that, good news, right? That's great, because yeah. I go to Lutra, it's uh, mm -hmm. likely that I could get a job. Yeah. Because there's a culture awakening. A lot of construction, there's a lot of farming starting again. So, yeah, there's work out there for sure. This is great. This is great. I'm going to have to have the uh, minister responsible for Family Island Affairs, Mr. Clay Sweeting, the Honorable, to come mm -hmm. in and talk with us a bit about this. But we got to get to Miss Wallace. She's waiting in the Zoom room. I've had her in there for far too long. Uh, producer... Let me know. Good morning, Ms. Wallace. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well. How are you? I am good. Thank you. I am good. Thank you. So I sent you some notes. There's been lots in the news. I think Mark has been in Eleuthera, but I'm sure he's been keeping up with it. I, uh, I don't know where to start. Um, should we start with you walking us through the... Uh, well, of course, we should start with you introducing yourself, uh, although you're a regular on the show. Uh, but should we start with the Strike 5 campaign, with you walking us through that? Uh, should we start with an assessment of the bill put forward by the government? Uh, should we start with talking about consent? Or um, should we start with uh, you walking us through Equality Bahamas' advocacy to criminalize marital rape over the last 10 years? Uh, we can start with the Strike 5 campaign, and I can weave in what is in the draft amendment bill, the last version that we saw, and cover those two at the same time. Okay, awesome. Uh, so please introduce yourself. I'm Alicia Wallace. I'm the director of Equality Bahamas, which promotes women's and LGBTQI plus people's rights as human rights. We've been doing this work since 2014 with a very specific focus on gender-based violence and recognizing that it goes beyond interpersonal violence. It includes structural violence. And structural violence includes inequality in laws and policies. So in recent years, we've been focusing quite a bit on laws that need to change and policies that we need to create. Okay, and so the, the campaign for uh, the criminalization of uh, marital rape is a part of that larger uh, body of work? Yes, absolutely. Okay, cool. So the strike... The Strike 5 campaign we launched on International Women's Day in 2020. Mm -hmm. That's when we really start, decided to pull together a lot of the work that we had been doing in previous years, particularly since 
2018 when we had a previous draft bill that was very far off from what we actually needed. And in 2020, we said, okay, we need to come up with some very clear elements that we need to see in the new bill so that we don't go through this process again and end up with a bill that's severely lacking. Mm -hmm. That's what we did. And the Strike Five campaign is really about striking out the five words, who is not his spouse, Mm -hmm. from the definition of rape so that the Sexual Offenses Act applies to everyone, regardless of marital status. So that's the main function. That's the main sort of catchphrase of the campaign. But there are some other demands that we have in there that are incredibly important if we want to ensure that we're not just criminalizing marital rape, but we're doing it in a very clear, specific, and explicit way. All right. And, and explicit means clear and easy to see and understand, right? Yes. Like there, We don't have to do any guess means or who this applies to or, or if the law is actually going to work for people. So amending the definition in Section 3 of the Sexual Offenses Act is the first thing, and you'll hear a lot of people talking about that, who is not his spouse striking that out. Mm -hmm. Uh, We also called for the repeal of Section 15 because it would really be unnecessary once the definition of rape is changed. It would then apply to everyone. So previously, Section 15 was on sexual assault by spouse. Mm -hmm. Um, Looking at the only in areas where marital rape was really considered. Again, Mm -hmm. it was not being called rape. It was being called sexual assault by spouse. And it would only apply if people had been separated. So, of course, this would be no longer necessary once we amend Section 3. So we are seeing that those two are already in this, the last draft bill that we have seen in September 2022. The definition is changed in that draft, and they have repealed Section 15. Um, The next thing that we called for is the inclusion of a statutory definition of consent. So at present, the Sexual Offenses Act refers to the definition of consent that's in the penal code. So of course, this definition is pretty old. It's quite general because it's used in the law. It's not specific to sexual violence. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't want to have to look at a general definition We want one that's adequate and really applies specifically to sexual violence. We have seen that that has been included in the current draft as well. So there is a definition of consent there now. All right. Can I I, uh, stick a pin right there? What I appreciated is uh, in the bill, rape is defined as, quote, the act of any person not under 14 years of age having sexual intercourse with another person Uh, without the consent of that person, where he knows that the person does not consent or is reckless as to whether the person consents, right? Um, And I I, I thought that's great to to see that language in the legislation, right? Where he knows that the person does not consent or is reckless as to whether the person consents. This, uh, the, the bill, like you say, the statutory definition is more expansive than the penal, uh, code, the penal code's definition. Is, and this would be the first um, definition in statute law, right? This would be the first time it ever appears in statute law, or are there other pieces of legislation that provide a statutory definition? This will, I think this will be the, the first and the only. Okay. Um, just, just to hear the, the wording in the new provision, right, in the, in the bill's provision, it sort, of exp- it sort of gives you a sense of how important consent is and how, Im- how important it is to understand what consent means. I, I, yes, and it's another reason I think that we need that definition in there because just having this conversation, talking about criminalizing marital rape and what it looks like, the draft circulating and there being discussion about it, it forces conversation about consent. Mm-hmm. And when we look at the definition, it really helps us to understand how little a lot of people around us understand about consent and respect people's right to consent or withhold consent. Mm-hmm. And, and not just not just in this particular sphere, right? Not just when we're talking about sexual intimacy and sexual intercourse. Uh, we could see that people don't understand it or don't respect it in many other mm. spheres. I mean, what is the... Um, just interested to know, 
what is there any pushback to those definitions because I was, I was reading them and they actually make a lot of sense and they're educative as well if that's a word you know they educate you what it actually means have you have you actually had any pushback on those clauses interestingly i haven't seen any pushback on the definition of consent it's more the bill in general right. i think people are so riled up about this concept that women are people and have bodily autonomy that the details don't really matter to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I am also, if I could read it out uh, from the bill, quote, uh, consent and the accused belief that the person with whom he is alleged to have had sexual intercourse or who he is alleged to have indecently assaulted, right? Consent shall not be inferred by A, reason of silence or lack of physical resistance on the part of that person, or B, reason of sexual arousal on the part of that person. So it's saying that uh, you can't just assume that the person has consented because they don't actually fight back or they don't actually say no. And you can't uh, assume that the person has consented because their body or their behavior mm -hmm. states, shows, or suggests that they are aroused. I think that to to like Mark said, it's very educative to to state that clearly will be a, a very good thing and an important thing. Definitely, and we need to make this very clear that it doesn't matter that somebody did not outright say no. There are many other ways that you don't want to participate in an activity. Yeah. Um, and we've seen in recent years, I think over the last ten years, that there's been a bit of a shift when we talk about um, rape. The the line used to be no means no, and we still use it a little bit, mm -hmm. but these days a lot more people are saying only yes means yes. Mm -hmm. Because you, could, uh, you can understand, you know, when somebody in a position of trust or authority would create that kind of situation where you don't, you know, where the victim doesn't say or doesn't respond in that way because purely by that unsaid power. And that, that's being defined now as well. I think that's really good. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Ms. Wallace, that's the uh, music. It's time to go to a break. When we get back from the break, a call, some texts, and then we get right back into it because uh, that B, reason of sexual arousal on the part of that person, that's the root of the conversation when that men can be victims of rape as well. So to the audience, stay tuned. You're on the clock. Don't change that dial. We'll be right back. <music> Hey, Lisa, I hear Fidelity is free. Women Plus Seminar is back. Oh, yes, it is. My ladies and I are ready to go. Well, I heard it's open for men, too. So you know my crew and I will be there. The highly anticipated free Fidelity Women Plus Seminar will be held on Saturday, October 29th at the Bahama Convention Center as we explore solutions towards achieving financial freedom. The Women Plus Seminar is free and includes breakfast, eight sessions, plus over $8,000 in prizes and surprises. Registration and breakfast begin at 8 a.m. with sessions from 9.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. Space is limited, so register now for free at fbbwomanplus.com. Love the show? Want to give your support? Become a sponsor today. Call 302-2300 for our rates and packages. That's 302-2300. Become a sponsor on Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Fresh news, smart talk, all day. No matter who I marry, no matter if our children will be Bahamian, like me. If I marry a man who's not Bahamian, I have to give birth in the Bahamas or my children won't even be Bahamian like I am. That don't even make sense. That's why we had the referendum in 2016. But the people vote no. The government can still do something about it with ordinary legislation. And it needs to develop an action plan and timeline to hold another referendum to deal with gender inequality in the Constitution. Oh, well, we can make that happen. Go to tiny.cc backslash nationality to support the campaign for equal nationality rights by Equality Bahamas.
Good morning and welcome back to Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. You are on the clock with Erin Green. Mark, I got to read some of these texts. Uh, Miss Wallace, good morning. You back? I'm back. All right, I got to read just a couple. It says, Erin, the punishment for Mark isn't firing. You send him on, you send him on vacation. This is the government service, you know. Mark, Mark, you got, you got some labor advocates out there on your side. Um, some people, another text, some people know when to step down. Not everyone is captivated by power to the peril of their country. I applaud her for knowing when to step mm -hmm. down. I'm going to be honest with you, text. I, I appreciate that sentiment. I really do, right? But no, this is gender equality here. She going to get the same lashing that every male candidate is open to. She should have never take the position. She should have never let them goosey her into that position. When she, you could look on her face talking about, I'll hit the button. I'll hit it. She wasn't ready for that. She was not. I knew she was. A, you could look at her and you look at every Bahamian woman you know. Hmm. <laughs> Everyone I know. I'd have put them in power before her. Right? There's just something. Like, you, don't, you didn't get it. You think Margaret Thatcher was not smiling? <laughs> Because she's miserable. No, she's not smiling because she know the task at hand. And uh, yeah. But at least she, when it really got hard, she did the right thing. And mm -hmm. she stepped down. Um, Fred Mitchell, don't smile. I met Margaret Thatcher once. She was very small. I mean, she was a tiny woman. Yeah, that's why and, she couldn't smile. Yeah, and she was tiny you know she's so powerful and yet you know when you see people on tv you know they look a lot bigger than they are i was quite shocked how yeah. frail i mean she was getting on her age but how frail she was yeah all right let's get back to these okay. i know because yeah. i was going to say uh, you know the queen also being a sort of frail and powerful at the same time figure maybe Ma margaret sort of won like a lot of it was just perception mm. you know and and but that's cool. Another text to Aaron, does the act say he or are you saying he and if only say he and not she or even they for non-binary individuals? Okay, so the law is written like in all he's, all man's. It implies she. But it implies she, right? And so I studied law a little bit, not enough to actually, you know, finish the exam, but I studied a little bit and maybe that's just a little bit of legal culture in me. Um, but the way that the law is written is written as he, but the law is gender neutral and applies to both mm -hmm. uh, male and female spouses. Uh, Aaron, don't start that. Now, you want me to send some ch Chinese for you, eh? Things are not great in the Lutheran. It's very hard there. The people are very unhappy, and illegal immigrants have taken over a huge amount of crown land to make shanty mm. towns. Well, I'm going to tell you all a secret. I can share with y'all a secret. Wherever you see Haitian migrants, you see development. You hear me? Wherever you see Haitian migrants, people are waking. And they're waking for other people. Now, it's up to me and you to see if the government see that. But I bet the government does see that. Because did you know, in the procedure, the ensuring that their employee is living in government regulated or approved housing now that doesn't now it's supposed to mean housing that a government official approved after assessing it with their own eyes right but i think for the purposes of convention it just mean oh this fit what the papers say okay then they cool but don't forget that all right erin five minutes into having sex, your spouse don't want to continue. You can't tell the law you didn't have sex, but now they're claiming you raped them. It's tricky. It is tricky, but then what you do is you learn the law. And in the common law, there was a ruling that said that if you were in, and it's not subject just to married people, right? This is general law. If you are engaged in sexual intimacy, you are, and it's midterm break, tell your children, go in the nether room. You are engaged in intimacy, you are in the act of penetration. Your partner says, no, please stop. The law says due to the nature of the act itself, we, we, we know that a person, a man, needs a moment to catch themselves to realize what was said to him. And so the person says, no, 
we expect or we allow technically, because I'm not a lawyer, iterative action. And then you are required to stop. Like you catch yourself. The person say no. You catch yourself mm. and you stop. The law acknowledges that it may take you a moment to catch yourself and understand what is being said to you. And then you stop. It should make no difference whether it is your spouse or not your spouse. Whether it is sex work and a client and customer, you know, and, and service provider, it matters not. And so it is not that tricky. It's just a matter of whether you have personal discipline or not. Uh, we can get back to the text. Good morning, caller. You're on the clock. You get uh, 30 seconds. How you do? Good morning. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Uh, this thing with the marital rape sex is opening a can of worms that we're not ready for. Now, biologically, see, we're not looking at the biological part of this thing. A man, when he gets in his 40s, being 50, 60, he does, his testosterone level drops. So, therefore, his erections are few and far and in between. Mm -hmm. Now, if far and few and in between is a month, two months, and, more, and then pressure also on the outside world, in the world, uh, if you're a responsible man and you're taking care of your family, if you're under pressure, you're not going to have erections like you used to. So, therefore, if when I do have an erection and I go to my wife, and she knows we haven't had sex for about two months, three months, and I touch her and she shrugged me off. I am now going to go to the police and report her. Because you see, the first one reached the police is what the people, the police look at. Hold on. So you going to, if she tell you no or gives a clear, in, you know, physical indicator that she's not interested, you're going to go beat her to the police and say she tried to rape you? That's what's going to have to happen. Because you see, she said when she made her vows were better off or worse. Okay. And they fulfilled your duties. And then you know what that opens up also? The oldest trade of mankind, prostitution. You go to your sweetie. Yeah. Because when you have that, you want to get that release. Yeah. And if you can't get that, if she's denying you to protect yourself, you go to the police station and report her, start building a file on her. For, for this, abandonment or, or for you will... Whatever, because she's not having sex with you. Listen, dear, dear, dear caller. Dear, all right, go ahead. Um... No, man, you can't lie on her. No, but she's not. If, I, if it's taken me a month or two, because see, and then on the back of that, a man has to get ready. You're all ready. Oh, no, you're not ready. You all don't have that, that brain and penis connection. Somebody you know, told me I had it. You know, I told them there's a liar. <laughs> I told them there's a liar. Dear caller, listen, I'm not making fun, right? I, um, I'm not making fun. Let, let's start here. I sort of appreciate what you're saying, right? As we get older, the opportunity for this experiences diminishes. Now, I'm going to share something with you. That isn't necessarily true. I don't know if, uh, if men really believe that, that it's age that causes you to lose your ability, right? In many, many instances, it's health. It's physical health but it's also psychological and emotional health as well. Now, I am about to call myself the leader of the men's dem because I didn't know that y'all was in this state. I didn't know that y'all didn't realize what was happening to y'all own bodies. This is just a matter of health. And there's a lot of young men, anyway, we gotta get back to this, just a whole nother show because there are a lot of young men that are experiencing erectile dysfunction. And it turns out that y'all don't know that it's due to poor diet and lack of exercise and psychological health. Ah, oh boy. Okay, Ms. Wallace. Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Uh, good to have you back. So, let's sort of uh, take off from that spot, right? How do you respond to the suggestion or the implication that being accused, falsely or not, of marital rape is actually worse than experiencing marital rape. And I've, I've heard men say that. Yeah, I'm not prepared to, you know, litigate which one is worse. I think both are awful. You, you don't want to be a victim of sexual violence of any form. Right. Definitely don't want to be a victim of rape. And you don't want to be a victim of false accusations. So we need the law to address both of those. Right now, the, the law addresses one. It addresses the issue of false accusations. It's in there. Yeah. 
the Sexual Offences Act does not deal with marital rape. So let's talk about the things that we still need to do. And what we still need to do is criminalize marital rape. I got you. What, what do you think is the biggest barrier <clears throat> to the enactment of this bill? Because it's been going on for a long time, right? Yeah. And it's now now going through. How many, which iteration now? It's like, I don't know. But what are the barriers? What do you think is going to stop this or, or stop your the campaign? The main barrier really is, is the lack of political will. We're seeing that the government of the Bahamas is continually putting it on us, putting it on the people and not doing it in an honest way. It's being quite disingenuous where it's setting the conversation up to be a debate and it's leading us to debates about humanity and about who deserves um, the right to bodily autonomy, who deserves the right to make their own decisions about sexual activity. What it should have done, the government, is acknowledge its obligation to protect everyone's human rights, including women, including people who are married, and acknowledge that it has made these commitments just by virtue of operating within a democracy and by ratifying and adopting various conventions and declarations, which it has done voluntarily. No one has forced the Bahamas to sign anything. Our government has decided that it is going to accede to certain things, including the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which we call CEDAW, um, Balam Dupara, which is regional. We, we signed on to these things willingly, and it's, it's a legal commitment now. And what needs to happen is it has to come home and domesticate these laws, domesticate the international standards of human rights. The government knows that it needs to do these things. And it seems to continually create an environment where it looks as though it is facing resistance from the people. Absolutely. It continues to do that. That resistance isn't just coming. It's it's as a result of the way that the conversation is framed by the government. Well, mm -hmm. listen, I got to get to this caller, but before I do, a question for you to consider. Is the state centering the church in this conversation or is the church centering itself in this conversation? But let me get to this caller. Good morning, caller. You're on the clock. Good morning, how you do? Listen, I am very concerned about the Bahamian men that have such a major problem with this. They just tend to be concerned about themselves because they say, oh, I don't want to be falsely accused. But if you're not one of those who are raping your wife, then you should know that you're not going to be falsely accused. Your wife is not one of those persons. So why are you concerned? There are two concerns for my 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 good. I ain't gonna lie. It, it, it's kind of very uh, funny. the amount of Bohemian men in, in in the positions that they are in to to not want to see this go through. I wonder what happened in this. Mm -hmm. This would help a lot of homes to be better and help the because. I'm sorry, we lost you there. Uh, Producer, we, the, the call got a little staticky. I'm sorry, caller, but I really appreciate the point that you shared. Um, because, And I appreciate the energy that you came with. I can tell you all, I feel a lot of, uh, I don't know, sympathy and empathy for men and, and for that the male caller and for these men who... Because how do you marry somebody, right? And how do you live in a culture that uh, pushes marriage up, right, As, and holds it up? as a thing to be revered? How do you live in that space, but then also feel like you're in a culture where you individually or men generally... Have the power. Right, or yeah. don't have the power and are not safe and could be falsely mm -hmm. accused of something so dastardly at any time. I think this con these conversations raise for mm -hmm. us that we need to talk more. Anyway, that's the break. We got to get to the break, Miss Wallace. Uh, we will be right back. You stay tuned, 96.9 FM. Love the show? Want to give your support? Become a sponsor today. Call 302-2300 for our rates and packages. That's 302-2300. Become a sponsor on Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Fresh news, smart talk, all day. 
unequal gender nationality law is a violation of human rights and a failure of the government to meet its obligations. In 2018, the CEDAW Committee told the Bahamas to set a clear time frame for constitutional reform, to integrate the principle of gender equality into all laws, and to amend the Bahamas Nationality Act 1973 for Bahamian women and men to transmit citizenship on an equal basis. Join Equality Bahamas in demanding action now. Visit tiny.cc slash nationality for more. This is Guardian Radio 96.9 FM, Nassau, Bahamas. Good morning and welcome back to On the Clock with Aaron Green and Mark Palmer. Joining us this morning is Alicia Wallace. Miss Wallace, I, uh, I know we took a little time this morning to talk about a couple of other things, but I thought the, uh, the British PM discussion would, was a great link to this discussion because, you know, we like powerful women until we don't like powerful women, right? And, uh, Very so, true. You know, it's great to make that link, but... Uh, Caller, you got 30 seconds. You're on the clock. The gentleman that just called a little bit, I mean, a little earlier, I wanted to also add something else. Yes, sir. It seems like what we, the men are going to have to do now with their wives is stick the timetable on the refrigerator the night they're going to have sex. But listen, sir, hold on. Wait, why you think that's a bad idea? Wait, wait, don't call back, though, because I, I already 45 minutes in the hole. But what that, I'm that saying sounds is... like a slippery slope argument, right? Oh, yeah, that's a but, terrible <laughs> idea. No, it's consent. Consent is for an activity at a particular period of time, and you can change your mind at any time, right? Right, absolutely. And, and that's involved so as well. I can agree well. today that, yeah, let's do this thing on Thursday, and on Thursday, I don't feel like it anymore. Yeah, absolutely. But people should be talking. They should be saying, hey, I value you, and I know you're busy. And I know you have 850 things to do on the plantation. And I just letting you know whenever you have some time for me, I have time available for you. I'm not saying make a timetable, but I like the idea of greater communication because I think that's what's missing in these dynamics, right? Is uh, a, a, a lack of communication and then in a deeper space, an inability or the feeling that I am unable to communicate these things, the feeling of vulnerability, the feeling of possible rejection. I tell my love I want to have you know, be intimate with them and they reject me and right that there are all kinds of things and that, mm. that at least this is a start of the conversation. But don't do that to your partner. Don't I, put up a time table, an intimacy timetable. No. no, but Alicia, what can you say to reassure people, you know, who have those views that this is somehow, you know, going to uh, interfere with their marriage vows, et cetera, et cetera. How do you, how can you reassure them, you know, bring them to, uh, I guess, to the real world? You know, it's it's really troubling that people take that approach and, and have that interpretation versus looking at it as a way to protect themselves and to strengthen their marriages um, and, and to see this as something to have a conversation about. You know, was there ever a time where you felt obligated, where you didn't want to do something with me, but you did it because you thought the consequence would be, you know, being iced out or being harmed in some way? You know, this is an opportunity to have conversations to see where... You're on the same page. A lot of these things don't get discussed during the dating or the courting period or even the engagement period. So this is a great opportunity for people to have conversations. Um, it's really strange to hear the sort of defensiveness from, from men and, and probably not label themselves as rapists um, yeah. or, or people who sexually violate other people. But there's an entitlement there. And we really have to question that. Why do you feel entitled to someone or to an activity that has to include someone else? Okay. Why do you feel that yeah. you are under threat when someone else's rights are now being domesticated and being understood and being put into the law? What is the reason that you're so uncomfortable? Um, and, and it's not, it doesn't seem like the fair is where they are expressing it, right? So that the expression is that, oh, 
people are going to start falsely accusing their husbands. What, why did you go there? What is going on in marriages or in your marriage that you think that that is going to be the result mm-hmm. Interesting. rather than a positive result? So I, I think we have to have a lot of conversations. We have to include more people. We need to include therapists, particularly those who are working with couples to kind of mm-hmm. talk through some of these issues. Absolutely. I've got a text that says, good morning. Do the caller have a man or a husband? I think this topic should be between a marriage couple to discuss. If you're not, I don't think you should have anything to say. They are trying to destroy marriage. I'm going to be honest with you, texter. I really appreciate this text. I don't want you to think I'm being rude. Let's talk about it. The only people who could be destroying marriage is married people. They only, you know, when um, uh, he man say, I have the power, people have the power to destroy marriage. Married people are the ones who take the vows and married people are the ones who are obligated to protect them. Now, we as a society can support marriages, right? We as a, as communities can support marriages, but only married people could destroy marriages. And I wanted to ask this question, what if the for worse in the vows, for better or for worse, was just indefinite periods of celibacy. What if not knowing when you're going to have sex with your wife again is the worst when you say you're going to stay with them no matter what, for better or for worse? Why does the worst have to be take licks or I will have sex with you even though I know you don't want to or you are uncomfortable. Why is that, um, dear texter? And isn't that like something that is a, a greater chance of destroying the marriage? Another text says setting a date night is a great idea, but not if you know the least be, bit interested. Like, and not just that, mm-hmm. if you have a timetable, but you know that that day for whatever reason your wife was unable to take time, that she spent nine hours out of her eight-hour day just moving and hustling and working, wouldn't it be reasonable to say, hey, baby, I know you had a rough day. If you don't want this, let's reschedule. What's wrong with that? But I I love that text, uh, another text. These women always nagging, and if I don't buy gifts or help pay her bills, I get no sex. That is wrong. So mentally, I will not want sex, and I am the bad person. I mean, why would you want to have sex with somebody who is on the brink of being homeless? Like, why would you want to have sex with somebody who should be focused on how many cookouts they're going to need to pay their mortgage this month? i just saying, why you don't want to be down with the struggle? Another text. It's is, interesting that people uh-huh. raise all of, all of these different scenarios, right? When we're talking about one one thing, there are all these all these excuses, all these so-called reasons. But these are all issues of communication and deciding what you want your relationship to look like. So, you know, to Mark's question earlier, how do you how do you talk to people who are you know concerned that this is going to do something to their marriage? Aaron said earlier, only only the people in a marriage can make decisions about it. Right. Like the law is there for protection. You don't have to use particular laws if you don't want to. If you feel like they don't apply to you, if you feel like you're going to consent every time or if you think that you have given vocable consent forever and ever, you don't ever have to use this law. It's there for the people who want to use it. And the same goes for any other conversations that we have about marriages when we talk about, you know, equally sharing domestic work. And care work. If you decide that, no, that is me. That's my job. I want to do that by myself. I don't want anyone messing with my system. Great. No one is going to force that on you. But I think what we're seeing here is that we really need to have conversations with the people that we're in relationships with, whether we're married or not. We have to have conversations about what is a norm in the relationship. What are some things that feel unfair, that are uncomfortable? How can we change them? Um, and if if this none of this is working for us, if we can't come to an agreement, is this a time for us to part ways? These are conversations that we should be having all the time. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. I do, I just, the next, I know we're almost all out of time. Mark, you jump in at any time and, mm-hmm. and sort of grab the mic. I don't understand why people don't take the free counseling, <laughs> pre-marriage counseling seriously. First of all, Bahamians, it's in your blood. Anything free is worth ex- exploring. Sh- briefly, marriage counseling, do it. 
You're supposed to meet the parents. You're supposed to talk to the parents. And in fact, you're supposed to know that you're not old or grown enough to have sex if you are not able to talk about the life mm-hmm. in front of the priest and your family. And that, that, like, that's the rule. And if you're too shy, you, that means you haven't qualified yet. That's all. And I think that should be a rule. If you if you're 35 and you ain't married and you're too shy to talk about sex with your your new husband in front of the priest, then you ain't old enough to be having sex. I think that could be a rule. I am almost I'm all out of time, so Mark, you got to jump in and say it. If well, you- I, I was just thinking, Alicia, do you have like uh, you know the ten? We've heard some of those concerns on the radio today. Is there like a document that you can prepare? You know, here are the ten big concerns about removing those five words and this is what our answer is because I think we need to have some some do, you know something we can look at and that that's data ba- you know that's proper scientifically based that's data based mm-hmm. can you can you prepare something like that for men definitely we have a start to that already and we can definitely okay. add to it based on what we're hearing in the public discourse and you can access that at tiny.cc slash strike okay. the number five. I-V-E. So it's tiny.cc slash strike five with the number five instead of the F in strike five. Absolutely, Mark. That was a great way to end the show. But of course, I'm a woman and I can't let you have the last word. So I got to try to <laughs> finish read these texts dead quick. This law then, because both men and women touch inappropriately. Women tend to touch in social spaces more than men. My only question now is if I can go back and accuse those women who touch me without saying yes from five years ago of rape. Well, it would be indecent assault, and I don't think it's retroactive. Good morning, Aaron. Not only men are perverts, women are too. We need to stop blaming men for everything, and that's why this country is in a bad place. I will be honest with you, I don't blame men for everything. Not on this show. And you're right. Dear, uh, dear texters, I couldn't read the rest of your text. My producer has made the move. We're all out of time. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Miss Wallace. Thank you so much, Miss Wallace. Thank you, callers and texters. we got to talk more. Every voice needs to be heard. Have a great day, Bahamas. Thank you. This is Guardian Radio 96.9 FM, Nassau, Bahamas.